Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by the wonderful Sarah Fox. Hello, Sarah. How are you today? Hi, Amy. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. It's so lovely to be a guest on someone else's podcast and I can and relax and not worry about the questions. It's great. And you're used to doing podcasts as a host yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a, a podcast called Do Good and Do Well. Um, and I'm coming up to the first year anniversary, um, which is amazing. And I can't believe I've been doing it for a year. Um, but yeah, I love, I love, I love podcasts so much. <laughs> what do you love about them? Uh, I really love hearing from people who you wouldn't normally get to hear from. So for me, one of the things that I'm really trying to do in my podcast is amplify those voices that we don't usually hear. You know, particularly I work in particularly in the creative industries and often, you know, there are brilliant people, but often it's the same people that we're hearing from. Um, so I love I love the idea of having that conversation I love how informal they are as well and I love where they take you and I think mine's probably very similar to yours in that there's an overall theme but actually it kind of who knows where this conversation <laughs> will end um, and I find that really fascinating and I, I find talking to humans fascinating because we're complex and brilliant and resourceful and you know we, we want to hear more of that and hear more about the challenges that we have and that we share. And you said specifically talking to humans. Who else do you talk to, Sarah? <laughs> well, well, I, I don't think I could share that on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it, it is it is fantastic. And congratulations on your year anniversary. What a great oh, effort that is, because I know how much goes into pulling a podcast together. So well done for that. So do good and do well. Where did that originate from? Oh, well, that's my kind of community. That's what I, I founded this community called Do Good and Do Well. And the podcast actually is called Do Good and Do Well, How to Be a Change Maker Without Losing Yourself. And one of the things that I noticed both from my observation of others but also my own experience is that when you're a change maker and when I talk about change maker some people don't particularly like that phrase but it's but it's people who want to contribute positively to the world in some way or another um, those people will often give and give and give and give until they're actually quite depleted and exhausted and then they'll give some more and actually they're not really a they're not making the impact they want to make in the world and b they, they're losing themselves they kind of forget about why they're doing it what they want their life to look like you know their own wants and desires so do good and do well is really a call to action to say it is possible to do good in the world and be well and have a life that you love and not compromise on the impact that you make because you put yourself at the centre of the journey. So I, I think I heard the phrase on a, it was on another podcast actually, and it, it you know, those moments where you've been, I'm not very good at naming things. I've always struggled with that. <laughs> and as a project manager in the arts, it wasn't a, you know, um, uh, it wasn't a thing you kind of wanted because you had to 
you have to name a lot of projects and ideas. Anyway, so it was one of those moments where I heard it and it it just clicked. It resonated so much. And I remember writing a um on a post-it note, and I've still got it actually, and it says, um, it's not it's not bad um to do good and do well. And um yeah. So so a lot of what I do, most of what I do as a coach and as a mentor is around this idea of working with people who have such a strong desire to contribute in the world, but who want to also enjoy life and have joy themselves and not feel selfish or guilty about it. And I'm just listening to you, Sarah, and I'm thinking... Absolutely. You you want to create that life that you love without the compromise, being able to stay healthy and finding that joy. And I'm just wondering, was this a case of you, you also mentioned about giving and, and depleting yourself and losing themselves? Was this a, a cathartic process that you went through and now you're giving it out to others? Yes. Yeah, there's two parts. There's the observation. So I've, I've, I worked in the not-for-profit sector for over 20 years, working with people who had come into that world really wanting to make a difference. And I saw how much they gave, you know, the number of hours they worked, the energy that they put in. Um, and I saw people, you know, I saw that costing people personally, their, you know, their family life marriages you know their health their well-being and then I worked for an organization which was all about arts and kindness so how can we create um, kinder more caring communities through arts and creativity and I worked for that organization for nearly 10 years and absolutely loved it and after about eight or nine years so in that time I'd had my two children as well. My life had kind of changed. Very, it was very different to how it was when I started there. And I loved it and I gave everything. And what I found was that I was being very, very kind to everybody at work and all the participants of the projects and the artists and the partners that we were working with and, you know, all of that, giving so much. And then I would come home and I had no energy to do anything else had no energy to be kind <laughs> to the people that I was living with. You know, I, I wasn't a particularly nice person, quite snappy, frustrated, stressed. Um, and I remember being at my mum's house one day at her kitchen table and just saying, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't do that constant, like being at work and then being a mum and then doing the house and it just feels really tiring and I don't feel like I'm really engaged with any of it anymore, which was hard because I really loved that organisation, really loved it. So I, I had to make a decision about what would be right for me. And I asked myself, who needs me most right now? And the answer was my family and me. And yeah, so I left that amazing organisation Um and so, yeah, it is that, you know, I've been there. I understand it. And, of course, we all have different experiences. And, you know, I know that for me, a lot of that giving was around people pleasing. And this is this is in hindsight, right, didn't they? <laughs> so at the time, this is through me becoming a coach and, and understanding these stories and, and, and having therapy and all those things. Um, but, you know, and, and, I'm, and for a lot of change makers, that can be the case. Actually, you're not giving from a place of enough you're giving because you want to be liked or you're giving because you're you know you really want to achieve and and so I think my own experiences feeding into this idea of do good and do well are it, it's an important thing to pay attention to and you mentioned that it was with hindsight that you can see all of this now, Sarah, and that it, you could see how you were people pleasing and that you were you'd become a different person at home because you were depleted or you'd completely given everything at work and there was nothing left for for those you love. And and, and often and I know when my husband is going to be editing this podcast later, he's going to be nodding, thinking, <laughs> yeah, recognize this, recognize this. <laughs> and it was a case of you do you, you, you give your love ones 
all the all the the bad energy because you know that they'll forgive you for it yeah yeah and it's like children isn't it you know uh, when you go to an um parents evening and you hear about how brilliant your children are how engaged they are how they're curious and kind and polite and all of those things and then you look at your reality and you think oh hang on a minute <laughs> there's something something's a bit different here because it is a safe space your home is a safe space for you to be able to kind of kick off those shoes get rid of that mask um and you know really be who you are at that time but unfortunately when 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 that is sorry when you're not in a state to be your kind of best self at home other people are suffering because of that and you're suffering because of it you know nobody wants to be at home and just like feel so exhausted that they can't enjoy being at home they can't enjoy socializing with their own friends that kind of thing so why was there a, an either or scenario Sarah why couldn't it have been that you had the best of best worlds of both worlds that you were able to retain the job and also give that time to yourself and and look after yourself Mm. I think I didn't realise it was possible because I hadn't heard that story before. And actually, it's interesting you asked me that question. I hadn't really thought of it in that way. But I think, you know, part of my mission is to say to people, you can do both. Because for me, it was a case of I didn't know how to move forward with it. I didn't have any role models, particularly of women who are, you know, working senior leadership roles, um being very boundary you know most most of the people that I had worked with both within the organization and externally were working way more hours and they were paid for in the arts you know financial well-being is a real problem because people are generally not paid very well for what they do and um and I think I think there was something for me about I mean, and I was very privileged, very, very fortunate that I could stop working. I didn't have anything else to go to. Um, so I know that that's also not an option for everybody. Um, but there was something for me about really stepping back and thinking about my why, you know, like thinking about what am I here on this earth to do? Um, what do I want my life to look like? how can I choose rather than feeling like, oh, I've got to be here and these are all the things that exist and I have got no control over it. Actually, how can I get control Um, and really decide on what's next? And I suppose part of that is that um, a few years before my dad had died, he died when he was 62. He died on his birthday, on Boxing Day. Um, I watched him pass away. Um, I just turned 40, you know, there were these kind of life things. I'd, um, uh, we'd had infertility issues. I'd had a miscarriage, you know, there were all the, these things that happened in that, in that very short space of time. I mean, it's 10 years, but relatively short space of time. And I think all of those experiences were making me think, hang on, life is short and I want to, know what's possible for me but I can't do that whilst you know and I was part-time you know it wasn't like I was working full-time either I was part-time um so yeah uh I think I've answered your question (laughs) so there's lots of different areas here Sarah that I I could pick on there's lots of different strands that you've just sort of unraveled and left me ready to pull on and I think the first one is is that mission that you didn't know how at the time you didn't have those role models in in the senior leadership and and they didn't have those those boundaries and so now you're very keen to show people how they can do both or they can compromise on different areas and have a more rounded view of of life yeah i think for, I've, I've been working a lot around this idea of life work balance um at the moment and i think everything comes down it comes down to me it comes down to choice. It comes down to 
enabling, encouraging, creating a space for people to feel like they have some kind of choice. And I think so often in this world, we can feel like we don't have choice. We don't feel empowered to make those choices. We don't have enough self-efficacy to feel like we can be brave and take those leaps. And... You know, I think when I'm working with clients on on this idea, some of it will be around the stories that we're telling ourselves or they're telling themselves around what's possible. Well, there's kind of two parts of it. The first is this, you know, what are the systems and the structures that are in place that exist that might be stopping you from having those choices and having that control and feeling, feeling empowered to live a life that you want and then the other part of it is that individual responsibility what's what's our responsibility in that um and creating a a life that is full of purpose it's funny you know when we think about well-being one of the biggest ways of increasing well-being is to connect with your purpose to have meaning and so for me that's interesting because I'm working with change makers who are you know who have a purpose who have somehow come into this world because they want to make a difference yet because of that as well they are overworking overstretch exhausted um so the mission really is about me being able to say where do you need to step back Where do you need to step in and what is your choice? What choices are you going to make? And becoming very self-aware of all of it, if that makes sense, Amy. (laughs) You know, it makes a huge amount of sense. And and the purpose strand is is obviously one that I'm, you know, wholly supporting alongside all of the other elements. But it does make a huge difference Mm -hmm. in, in your well-being. And you mentioned all the events, you know, some very sort of tragic and and sort of sad events that you've experienced. And I'm I'm sorry to hear about all of those across that time frame of the 10 years. Were were they the moments where they challenged you to to take control or they challenged you to sort of see a difference between your responsibility and not just letting life happen to you? Um, it was probably, it's probably a mix of both of those things, depending on the experience. I mean, it's interesting, I would say the infertility, because at the time, I didn't feel like I had any control over that whatsoever. Um, I suppose I did, looking back, I could have said, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to have this IVF treatment. I'm going to make a different decision. Um, But, you know, it was taken out of our hands once we had decided to go on on that treatment. And, you know, you have to follow, have all the injections at the right time and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I think things like with my dad, my dad, I remember having a conversation with him about three days before he passed away and there were so many things that he wanted to do so many things and one of what what I haven't said is that he was also a disabled man so he had cerebral palsy and I had had observed him living a life where he didn't feel like he fulfilled his potential um he didn't feel like he always belonged in a place he was a big people pleaser um And, you know, that idea of kind of him having to adapt, you know, he grew up as a disabled child in the 50s. He was very, very poor. Uh, Him and his family were very poor. So that I, you know, I could see from that that I do have a lot of privilege and that I do have choice. And wouldn't it be really unethical of me to not exercise that choice? Wouldn't it be a waste if I'm kind of not... um, reaching my potential you know I think what's interesting is coming out of the art sector and starting my own business is that my view of myself is just expanding of like what's possible and I never would have thought I could have done things like start a podcast and get my voice out there at that you know um so all of those experiences that I've had nourish me fuel me to do the things that I'm doing now So what changed? What gave you that belief that you could start to have a podcast? 
just doing it. <laughs> I think it's as simple as that. But I actually, one of the, one of the, I think my strengths is that I'm not a perfectionist at all. And I also, if I look back at my career, I'm, I'm not afraid of change and I'm not afraid of feeling fearful. And actually, I used to say to people, I quite like feeling a little bit scared. Like there's just, because it's amazing, isn't it? When you feel a bit scared and then you do it, like it's incredible. But I had always done it within the boundaries of someone else's organisation. And I, you know, you'd have to adapt because you've, you're on a particular mission because you're working for a certain organization that has that mission. And so I think coming out of it, training to be a coach has like, I wish, I'm sure all coaches feel like this, like I wish I had done that when I was at school because it is so empowering. Um, and I think I, I, I'm just taking action. And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. But everything for me is a learning um, that I can use, even if it hurts at the time. But, you know, it is. It's just like, just do it. You're sounding like a Nike advert right right now, Sarah. (laughs) I am. I'm full of loads of cliches, but, you know, they're cliches for a reason. (laughs) I love it. So having intentional actions and and being very self-aware, I mean, clearly you you, you have this incredible ability now to to understand yourself and feel empowered, which is, you know, that that absolutely comes from the coaching, but also that element of liking to be scared. So that must mean almost that your comfort zone is ever expanding because you you're you're moving out of it into your growth and to this discovery of a new world all the time so what's on the agenda what what are you planning oh well domination change uh, uh, um i think that's an interesting question because I'm planning on, you know, practically, I'm planning on growing my business, scaling my business, reaching more and more change makers, helping them to live lives that they love and make the impact they want to make. Um, You know, I I love my one-to-one work. I love my group work. I've facilitated group my entire career and I... um, it brings me so much joy. So there's that kind of practical stuff. But I think for me, there is something about just stepping into the brave, courageous, um, kind, compassionate human being that I want to be for the rest of my life and knowing that regardless of what it looks like practically that I can I can look back there's a question I ask um a lot of my clients which is when you're 95 and you're sat on a bench and you're someone comes up to you and they ask you to t- tell the story of your life what will you say and so often the answer isn't about particular projects about particular programs anything like that it's about how they want to be and if I can look back and say that I've been creative and courageous and I've connected and I've made a difference and I've been happy and joyful and I've survived then then that's my vision um yeah I think if you get to 95, you could fair, safe, safe to say that you you did survive. <laughs> I did survive, yeah. <laughs> but, but I love that. And I love the, the, the choice of words that you've got there, the brave, the courageous, the kind, the compassionate, the connected, the happy and the joyful. I mean, absolutely, what a wonderful story of life that is. And it is that, that joy that it comes down to. It comes down to the, that element of, of happiness. And, and you were talking earlier about purpose being very a huge part of the well-being happiness is is you know determined by uh, your sort of emotional baseline your life circumstances and that intention uh, intentional purposeful activity so how 
how is it that now you, you mentioned about the change makers and you also said that a lot of people don't like that phrase change makers, but you you're holding on to it. You use it. You've used it a lot. <laughs> um, so how is it that you're going to be moving these change makers into a space that they want to be? I, you know, I, it, I, it probably goes back to what we touched on earlier about seeing what's possible for people and the and you know that that's why the podcast is so important and the idea of reaching lots of people is so important because if we get to see ourselves in other people's stories we can start to see what's possible and it feels a little bit easier to take the action ourselves um so so for me I think I think it's that remind well firstly a reminder reminder to people that it's okay to well um uh, it's about rediscovering why they did their thing in the past I mean this you know this is what your podcast is about rediscover some people feel so disconnected to why they're doing what they're doing and it's all a bit scattergun approach and and um um not streamlined I'm sure there's a better way of describing that but um um and I think so yeah so for me to really help people reconnect to their purpose but also their values for me values are really important they um you know your core values not the ones that you've acquired from stories from culture but what you really really what really matters to you um and I think you know bringing those together with very practical ways of holding boundaries having difficult conversations with people so that you can get what you need without feeling guilty that you've offended someone um you know thinking about self-talk you know how we talk to ourselves I think there's so much around well-being and self-care that for me is just so surface level you know it, it's a growing industry there's a lot of um commodification commercialization around it and I think there's that for me helping change makers to really talk to themselves in a compassionate kind way um will really help to open up what's possible for them and you mentioned Sarah earlier about that you you feel as though you're privileged to be in this position to to really show what is important to you and that it would feel like a waste or it would be unethical and you you also just mentioned sort of that feeling guilty or without feeling guilty is there a lot of that that drives you that sort of away from that waste of of not living a, a life of fulfillment that really drives you as well as the towards motivation yeah I think there probably is I mean but at the same time I'm also trying to be um I'm trying to be kind to myself around that and know that I am also complex and human (laughs) and um you know the that there will be stumbles and there will be ditches that I end up in and um so so yes I think both that external motivation about you know helping others supporting others um making the world a, a, a nicer place for people to live in um f- to help them feel connected but that internal motivation of you know I don't I would hate to be um in a hospital bed like my dad was saying oh, only if only and um you know that I I used to say to myself I I could never be freelance I could never run my own business that's like for other people other people do that I'm here to be an employee (laughs) do the work you know and I think even if I got knocked down tomorrow I would think actually I've I have done the if only I have tried, I have been brave, I have been courageous. And I think that's it, isn't it? You know, it's, it's making peace with your own mortality 
and knowing that you know you are living every day because isn't it, that's that phrase isn't there that you know how we spend our days is how we we spend our lives and, and it is that that it, knowing that every day you're doing something that has that purpose and has that internal driver that is ticking those boxes that you mentioned about being brave being courageous and, and connected and compassionate and kind and knowing that every day hey you know if that's it if this is my lot then that's okay yeah and you know I wouldn't I wouldn't like people to think that I get up every morning jumping out of bed going you know I want to feel my purpose today and you know I've got it all sorted because that I honestly that is not the case <laughs> <laughs> at all um you know and I do, do you do that days... at the other end of the day do you dive into bed saying yes I did it <laughs> well I try and do gratitude at the end of the day to go you know what or what or something like a what have I done list so I feel like I have achieved something but I would also say um that I think part of my purpose is also to just is also to be mum and wife you know and also to be me and me in all of its glory and all the with all the flaws and you know it's sometimes yeah sometimes just having a day where you you know you don't necessarily connect to that I don't want to call it like a work purpose but for the purposes of this um that makes sense to me but you know, also just that sense of, you know, what if our purpose in life is just to be us? Yeah. That's a drop the mic moment. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what, what if? Absolutely. Yeah. But it isn't, isn't that, isn't that the, the, the real purpose is that we are all unique. You know, we are meant to do what we're meant to do and be who we're meant to be. And, we we have that you know it's a fundamental thing that is there it's there and it comes it shows that to us it purpose shows itself to us when we're quite young and then we bat it away and say no 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 that can't be it no 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 I'll go and try and and discover all these other things only to sort of find later in life that it's sort of there again it comes back to us and yeah here I am again I'm still here yeah it's funny you say well, not funny it's funny it's funny you say that because I wrote a blog and it was about volunteering and I, I started to volunteer from a really young age. Like I, I think one of the first, um, and I was an, an activist from a young age. So I, um, got a petition, so got lots of parents to sign a petition at the school so that girls could wear trousers. Cause at the time we could only wear skirts. Um, which is ironic because now my daughter never wears trousers to school. She refuses, <laughs> she refuses to, but anyway. Um, so, you know, and I was, I was, I did a lot of volunteering at school, helping younger, you know, junior school, helping younger children to read. But also I remembered like there was this patch of ground in the school. Um, and my friend and I got one of those um, like soil sieves. <laughs> We were taking out all the stones from the soil and trying to make this patch of land prettier for people to look at. And um, so I've always, there's something innately in me that is about others. It's about somehow, um, yeah, making the world better for others, whether that's something that they're looking at or, or helping them to feel a certain way and all of my work now is about that it's about creating space for people to be brave um you know I talk about creating safe spaces but also it's about creating brave spaces as well um and it you know and it is about I feel like if I can help all of these change makers agents of change leaders of change you know however people however people want to describe themselves that's the catalyst isn't it I'm the catalyst for more and more amazing stuff to be happening um in the world so it has a knock-on effect on those individuals but then the people that they're working with as well it has a knock-on effect with so yeah I can just I see when I look back I see this thread what I have to be careful of um is that I'm it's coming from a place of me feeling enough and not because I I just want people to think I'm kind <laughs> and nice 
So how are your family now knowing that you, well, you, you did compromise and, and you gave up that job and then you were very present for them. How do they find you in the house now? Are you still, are you snappy and grumpy and depleted? Um, I can be. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, just before we came on this call, <laughs> I shouted down the stairs, turn off the internet, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no one make a noise um uh I think that's a working from home thing though um I I think I am much more present I think I am a better um I don't really like that word but um I feel like I'm a better parent to my children I feel like I'm a better wife I listen more I um I think therapy also helped me a lot with all of that stuff. So it's the coaching and the therapy. Um, yeah, I do. I think life is more balanced. It's a balanced life full of purpose. Um, not it, it has its ebbs and flows, of course, but um, yeah, it feels good and exciting. I love that, Sarah. So do good do well absolutely I see how you've come through this whole journey yourself and now you you are absolutely creating those brave spaces for others to excel in and, and what a wonderful world it is how would people get in touch with you if they would like to be wrapped in this brave space that you're creating for them <laughs> um well I would love I would love to be more Amy Rodinson with my podcast and I'd love people to come and listen <laughs> and reach more people. So come and find me. I'm on all the podcast platforms as far as I know, and it's called Do Good and Do Well. Um, but also you can find me on my website, which is um, sarahfox.co.uk uh, and come and say hi, send me a message, send me a DM. I'm on all the social media. Um, yeah. Um, so come and find me and chat to me and talk to me because I yeah love conversations. Fantastic. Well, Everybody, you heard it here. Go and tune in to Do Good and Do Well. You've, you've listened to Focus on Why. So give Sarah's podcast a chance now. <laughs> yeah, come on, Amy. Get... <laughs> I'm hogging all the people, <laughs> hogging all the listeners in the world. No, not at all. This is, as you said right at the beginning, podcasting is incredible. And we are an incredible community in terms of how generous we are and supportive of one another. And um, Because there, there's plenty of space. There is plenty of space out there. And, and as you're creating plenty of brave space out there. So go out and get those voices heard. As you said, you, you want to amplify, amplify the voices of those who wouldn't usually have a voice or wouldn't usually be heard. Be heard. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's a big difference there. So yeah. fantastic. Sarah, it's been an absolute delight hearing your journey of purpose here. I've really enjoyed being taken down your 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 root of of all the different strands that you've shared so thank you and it is true talking to humans is fascinating <laughs> it is thank you amy i've really enjoyed our conversation brilliant how would you like to leave the focus on why listeners today i think i've mentioned it already but i think really consider your self talk you know, how you talk to yourself, um, what are those voices, how you celebrate yourself, how you criticise yourself, just become aware. Um, and then if it's not how you want it to be, you can find the tools to make it better. Thank you for listening to Focus on Why with me, Amy Rowlandson. To show your appreciation and to help other listeners understand what value you have received from tuning in today, please leave me an Apple podcast five-star review. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.